as I said last night, uh, we're so proud of the Theodore Roosevelt Honors Leadership Scholars, and we've asked them to do the introductions of our distinguished guests. And so today, Jacob Daniel, please come forward and introduce the great Simon Cordery. On behalf of myself, the entire Dickinson State University community, the Theodore Roosevelt Foundation, and Dr. Simon Cordery, I'm happy to welcome everyone to the second day of our annual TR Symposium. As Mr. Jenkinson mentioned, my name is Jake Daniel and I'm a sophomore at Dickinson State University. I'm currently majoring in health and physical education while minoring in coaching and leadership studies. I'm a proud member of the Theodore Roosevelt Honors Leadership Program and the Blue Hawk men's basketball team. Upon hearing the theme of this year's symposium, The Athlete in the Arena, I became very excited about the outstanding speakers that we're gonna have this weekend. Among these wonderful speakers is Dr. Simon Cordery. Although I only met Dr. Simon Cordery for the first time yesterday, I feel as if I already knew him. And that's because I was fortunate enough to have Dr. Stacy Cordery as my director for the TRHLP last year. And I learned a lot from her in just one short year. I was very fortunate to be taught by her and be guided by her. And we're very lucky to have the Corderies here with us this weekend. Dr. Simon Cordery is the chair of the history department at Iowa State University. Prior to his current position, Cordery chaired the history department at Western Illinois University and at Monmouth College. At Monmouth, he taught for 18 years and served as the women's soccer coach for seven of those years. And an award-winning author and historian of the transatlantic modern world, Cordery has published three books and a collection of academic articles. <laughs> Cordery's most recent book, The Iron Road in the Prairie State, was named winner of the George W. and Constance M. Hilton Book Award from the Railway and Locomotive Historical Society. Cordery teaches in many areas, including the field of sports history, and he is responsible for introducing sports history courses to three different institutions. Cordery says, Theodore Roosevelt embodied a life of action and thoughtfulness. His ability to capture and live the ideal of a sound mind in a sound body resonates with me personally as it does with so many people today. We understand as TR and his father did, how and why physical exertion and clear thinking are connected. To enjoy a full life, a useful life, is to comprehend how the strenuous life is as much an intellectual ideal as it is a corporeal injunction. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Simon Cordery. Well, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. That was a fantastic introduction. Thank you, Jake. I really appreciate that. And thank you as well to everyone who has made our trip here possible. It's been so far marvelous, and I hope it stays that way. We'll see. Let me know in an hour and a half. I'd like to thank everyone at DSU who made my presence here possible, especially President Easton, Dr. Chris O'Brien, and Kelly, Eric, and William of the TR Center staff. I'd especially like to thank Clay Jenkinson. Clay is the visionary, the public intellectual behind the symposium now in its 17th year, and of course the guiding light behind the, well, the, the entire TR Center. So thank you, Clay, for everything that you do for this symposium and for Dickinson State University. I'm going to make a bold assumption, an assumption that everyone in this room has heard of the strenuous life. No doubt you associate the strenuous life. Uh -huh. There we go. No doubt you associate the strenuous life with Theodore Roosevelt, and you would be right to do so. No doubt you're also well aware of the famous injunction from Theodore Roosevelt's father to, quote, make your body, because TR was not a strong boy. Growing up, he was racked by asthma, and he was physically something of a weakling. As he approached his teen years, he shot up in height, and he looked, according to Edmund Morris, something like a stork. Following a thorough physical exam, 
in, 19, in 1870, when the boy was 12 years old, T.R. Senior sat his son down and told him, quote, Theodore, you have the mind, but you have not the body. And without the help of the mind, without the help of the body, the mind cannot go as far as it should. You must make your body. It is hard drudgery to make one's body, but I know you will do it. T.R. followed this advice, and whether because of it or because he was simply leaving his adolescence behind, he grew out of his asthma. And for the rest of his life, he believed, and I think that's the key, he believed it was the strenuous life that allowed him to defeat asthma and to overcome his early beginnings. He, as we know, came to embody the strenuous life. Not quite so well known as Roosevelt's devout adherence to the strenuous life are the origins of that ideal. And so my task this morning is to give you the big picture of sports during Theodore Roosevelt's lifetime to show the wider story of the strenuous life. I'm going to begin by exploring the development of ideas about and institutions promoting physical fitness. I'm going to show how TR and his quest did not emerge in a vacuum. I'm going to examine the commercialization of sport as the strenuous life became a source of profit for some and entertainment for many. But first, let me begin by talking about the era. And I'm going to follow Professor Cullinane's lead here and deal with the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era as one long single time period, approximately, it, as, as I'm dating it, from 1876 to 1917, though I do like the idea of mapping it onto TR's life. The Gilded Age and Progressive Era was a time of rapid industrialization, of the growth of cities, of new waves of immigration, and most ominously for America's self-perception, the decline of agricultural labor. The proportion of people working in agriculture fell continuously following the Civil War. The Jeffersonian ideal, the independent yeoman farmer, had met its match in the thick smoke and belching infernos that American businessmen had built to produce material goods that American consumers would learn to demand. The country was changing and Americans seemed to be growing lazy. Work for many people, especially in the middle classes, became ever more sedentary. In this context, a national conversation about physical fitness and health emerged, and needless to say, Theodore Roosevelt had something to say about it. He wrote, always in our modern life, a life of highly complex industrialism, there is a tendency to softening of fiber. He acknowledged that workers in railroads and fisheries and other physical pursuits did indeed lead the strenuous life, but he felt that those who led sedentary lives in urban settings needed, quote, hard and rough play. Strengthening that fiber, both physical and moral, contributed to an era of innovation, democratization, and the professionalization of American sports. It was a period of increased leisure for middle and upper class families who enjoyed discretionary income that they would use to buy those commodities that American industry was producing. For wage earning Americans, the average working day dropped. It fell from about 12 to 10 hours and the average working week fell from about six to five and a half days. This is also a time of changing fashions for women, a time when loosely fitting clothes, or at least more loosely fitting clothes, made participation in sports actually feasible. This was a period in which wealthy Americans were emulating the English athletic movement, and this helped to give sports social acceptability. It led to the investment in facilities and to equipment. This is also a period of the commercialization of sport. In 1876, of course, a new professional baseball league, the National League developed, the National League emerged as a group of joint stock companies owned by powerful individuals. But of course, many Americans continued to live in poverty, disease, and fear. Many of these were first generation immigrants who worked in dangerous jobs and inhabited substandard housing. The fear these new arrivals generated, especially among long-settled Anglo-American families, 
also fed the craze for promoting the strenuous life. So let me talk about the ideology and the ideas that underpinned this new adherence to and promotion of physical exercise. One of the best known summarizers, one of the best known synthesizers of these ideas was G. Stanley Hall. G. Stanley Hall is someone that we would today call a genetic psychologist. He was a social Darwinist who believed that life was a struggle between different races, a struggle in which only the fittest would survive. Hall looked at everything through an evolutionary lens, including play and recreation. For Hall, play was important, and we had to understand it, according to him, because human beings evolve through stages of play, and these stages of play, according to G. Stanley Hall, are exact replicas of the stages through which human society has developed from hunting-gathering societies to complex industrial urban societies. He argued that human society meant that because humans had to grow as society did, every individual person had to pass through the stages of growth that every society was, would pass through. Play, he argued, teaches those stages. So for Hall, every individual must progress deliberately through each stage of play. For Hall, team sports were the apex. They were the acne. For him, team sports were the highest form of play because they encouraged advanced motor skills and cognitive growth while simultaneously developing the cooperative reflexes, as he would call them, in human beings. In team games, according to Hall, we learn the key virtues of obedience, self-sacrifice, self-denial, teamwork, loyalty, self-control, moral discipline, these terms are central to my talk, and I'm going to be repeating them throughout the, 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 the lecture. In a team, under Hall's interpretation, the collective was more important than the individual. And this had several important ramifications for sports. Adults had to supervise play. Adults had to supervise play in organized settings because otherwise the evolutionary development might be perverted. It might, children might do the wrong thing at the wrong stage of their growth. Second, the idea of universal stages of maturation into adulthood was designed to erase ethnic, religious, and class differences, though moral and racial differences would survive. Third, Hall recognized that boys and girls, men and women, were different. He argued that this difference was a key to understanding both human evolution and also to organizing play. Boys and girls had to be segregated in the playground. And fourthly, athletic pursuits would replace intellectual activity as a socially acceptable form of individual and collective expression. So that meant run and jump, don't sit and think. Do, don't contemplate, be active. That's kind of the key here, be active. And that's where TR and the strenuous life come back in. So let's turn to the rich soil in which these theories emerged and their application to physical fitness. So Hall's theories developed as part of a national conversation about the physiological state of Americans and physical fitness became a topic of great concern in the Gilded Age and progressive era, leading to its creation as a school subject. So if you're taking a physical education class today, as I understand many of you in this audience are, you will be hearing about the origins of why you do what you do. Physical fitness gained international prominence through the creation of the Young Men's Christian Association. Founded in 1844 in London, the YMCA promised to combine spiritual guidance and material assistance to young men migrating from the countryside to the city in search of work. It was designed to defeat the mental and physically debilitating effects of urban life. The YMCA was an early proponent of muscular Christianity, and historian Clifford Putney, in his book on the topic, defines muscular Christianity as an attempt to revive Protestant churches to save Americans from the morally and physically debilitating effects of city life, and essentially to bring men back into the churches. The churches, people felt, men felt, had become too feminized. Muscular Christians proposed to build recreational facilities, 
to create opportunities for exercise and to offer competitive sports and physical education along with deliberately linking those activities with spiritual health. The phrase muscular Christianity is most closely associated with the book Tom Brown's School Days. Tom Brown's School Days, which appeared in 1857, is set at a boarding school in England. The author, Thomas Hughes, did not use that phrase. That phrase appears in reviews of his books and earlier books by another author, Charles Kingsley. Reviewers, however, by using that phrase, created a genre and helped to form an ideology. The book is set at a private school in England, rugby, of course, private schools in England are perversely called public schools. It's a parable about the battle between good and evil using sports to illustrate how physical strength does not necessarily equal moral strength and how sports can build moral character. At rugby, according to the novel, sports teach lessons, moral lessons, about fairness, about teamwork, about selflessness, and about self-sacrifice. This is part of the, the Christian element of the muscular Christianity brand. Hughes wrote that Christians should use their bodies to advance all righteous causes. That's the muscular component of muscular Christianity. Muscular Christians wanted to eliminate the idea of the suffering Christ, of Christ as the, as the advocate for the meek and the mild. They saw Christ as a soldier, a soldier fighting a just war against evil and temptation. Controlling the individual human body, making it fitter, was a metaphor for reforming and improving the social body. So you won't be surprised to learn that their favorite hymn, in fact, something of their theme, was Onward Christian Soldiers, originally written for a children's process, but, but appropriated by muscular Christians, and of course, in 1912, by the Bull Moose campaign for Theodore Roosevelt. <coughs> Influential Americans saw with dismay what they perceived as the contrast between vigorous, healthy Brits and their own puny urban Americans. The difference they believed arose from the sports that were played on each side of the Atlantic. Robust Englishmen stood in, st in stark contrast to frail Americans, at least according to these observers, one of whom was Theodore Roosevelt Sr. Theodore Roosevelt Sr. met Thomas Hughes, and this meeting opened his eyes to what he had been seeing, but not really interpreting in the cities around him, especially in New York City. The vehicle that brought muscular Christianity to the United States was the YMCA. The first YMCA was founded in Boston in 1851. And then soon afterwards, another one followed in New York City, funded in part by Theodore Roosevelt Sr. Roosevelt saw in the combination of barbells and Bibles, the path forward for America. Why the Y opened gymnasiums across the country. It was an earlier employer of physical education instructors, and it pioneered sports as a means to finding salvation, religious salvation through physical activity. A leading proponent of muscular Christianity and a leading member of the YMCA was Luther Halsey Gulick Jr. Gulick looked to England for inspiration. He saw sports in the 1870s and 80s developing as what he thought was a proving ground of a new Christian masculinity, masculinity, exemplifying to his eyes, pluck and courage, a healthy mind in a healthy body, the amateur sporting ideals of the British aristocracy, and notions of fair play, respectability, and sobriety. In the United States, adopting these ideals was a reaction against the perceived effeminacy of American men and against the perceived sedentary nature of work. This outlook, this fear, influenced Gulick, who was also influenced by G. Stanley Hall. Gulick was the son of missionary parents, and he found in the strenuous life compensation for his own inadequacies. He suffered from migraines, depression, nervous breakdowns. In 1887, following completion of his medical training, he joined the staff of the International YMCA Training School in Springfield, Massachusetts. This was a school that offered a two-year program training YMCA physical education instructors. It encouraged playing organized sports as a way to generate spiritual growth. Sport should always be a form of recreation, of physical empowerment, and of spiritual improvement, Gulick wrote and Gulick taught. Keeping score 
or maintaining records for any reason was far less important in the original YMCA than developing all around skills and connecting physical activity with a robust spiritual life. Gulick and the YMCA, however, were not alone in promoting physical fitness and in training physical education teachers. Another leading advocate was Dudley Sargent. Sargent began his career working as an assistant professor of physical education at Harvard University. At Harvard, he administered the physical exams that every graduating senior had to undergo. One of the graduating seniors that he that, that he exa examined was Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt stood patiently as Sargent took measurements, as he asked about family members and their health history, and then made a diagnosis. His diagnosis, Sargent's diagnosis of TR was that TR should just basically sit down and do nothing. He was going to have a heart attack at any moment unless he took things easily. No wrestling, no boxing, no physical life, no physical activity. Physical exertion, Sergeant told the young TR, would kill him. But of course, TR had had a life filled with physical exertion at Harvard. He had famously boxed and wrestled, and he did so in part because he enjoyed them, but also because, as he wrote, I do not intend that anyone should laugh at me with impunity. Oh, you can laugh at me, but I'm going to beat you up. TR also skipped rope as part of his physical fitness regime. He rode horses, he climbed mountains, and he almost challenged a fellow Crimson to a duel. And the almost duel almost took place because he thought this other guy was a rival for the hand of Alice Hathaway Lee. Alice Lee of Boston was TR's first love. Alice Lee was herself an athlete. She was an excellent tennis player. She could compete with TR on even terms. She also could see the ball in a way that TR couldn't, so she had certain physical advantages there. But she could compete with TR on the tennis court. She was an excellent archer. Just before they married, she joined a tennis club in New York City to make sure she could continue with her avocation. Obviously, the perfect match for the man who would become the poster boy for the strenuous life. And needless to say, TR ignored Dudley Sargent's advice. He continued to rush upstairs to walk for miles at an end as fast as he could and to make his body. Sargent, however, despite this somewhat erroneous diagnosis, went on to create his own school, the Sargent School for Physical Education in 1881. And he did it because he believed that both boys and girls, men and women, should have physical training, that they should be physical education classes for everyone. Segregated, yes, according to G. Stanley Hall's dictates, but nonetheless, that there should be physical education for boys and girls. Dudley Sargent, the YMCA, and other fitness experts found a ready audience for their visions. But the growing popularity of competitive sports created a problem for the proponents of muscular Christianity. Competitive sports were great for recruiting people to the Y. However, when the emphasis switched from Christian values to winning at all costs, the Ys risked becoming little more than sports facilities shorn of their religious mission. They would be muscular, but not Christian. And yet the YMCA itself was partly responsible for this emphasis on competitiveness. Spurring the competitiveness was a sport invented at the YMCA, basketball. I'm sure that most, if not all of you, have heard of James Naismith, the Canadian physical education instructor working in Springfield at the International YMCA Training School, who was asked by Luther Gulick to create an indoor sport, create a sport that we can play in the winter. What Naismith created was a new and acceptable sport for women to play. There's no, in the original form of basketball, there was no dribbling or running with the ball. The only way that you could actually move the ball was to pass it. Women's sports, of course, were supposed to be neither as physical nor as competitive as men's sports, but it turns out that women really enjoyed playing basketball in part because it freed them to do the sorts of things they were not supposed to do, like scream at each other and throw the ball at each other, and even in cases that uh, some observers record, kick and scratch each other. Women's basketball 
had to change, and women's basketball did so. In 1892, Senda Berenson, a physical education instructor, was hired by the elite East Coast Women's College, Smith College. She introduced basketball into physical education classes, and she observed that it was still too rough and too masculine. She decided, Berenson decided, to write her own set of rules. Basketball for women would be, relatively speaking, calm, as you'll see tonight. We're playing by the 1905 rules tonight, not the original 1891 rules. Basketball would be calm, and it would be ladylike. The court, Berenson decreed, would be divided into three equal sections. The players could only move in one of those sections. They were restricted to one of those three sections. There were five to ten players per team. There was no physical contact. You could, under her rules, dribble the ball, bounce the ball twice. You couldn't move with it and then pass it. There was a time limit. And you were supposed to shoot with one hand, because shooting with two hands would cause health problems to your lungs, according to, well, <laughs> according to the early advocates of physical education. Berenson was not alone. Alternative rules emerged. There's a famous set of rules that emerged in New Orleans where the court was divided confusingly into nine different segments. All of these rules were slowly evaporated. In 1899, the sporting goods company Spalding & Co. published Berenson's rules. These rules became the official rules for women's basketball. Basketball proved that women could and should engage in physical exercise, that they could in avoid injury, and that they could avoid male assumptions and indeed contradict male assumptions about women as weak vessels who should not be allowed to run, to jump, or to bounce basketballs. And I know that Professor Anne Blaschke will have more to say about this later on this morning. So I'm going to move on to playgrounds. The facilities that we've been talking about, facilities at colleges, at YMCAs, were available to a small stratum of the American population. For the vast majority in towns and cities, playgrounds, open space for recreation and organized sports, were rare. This begins to change with the settlement house movement, but it takes a, a dramatic turn in 1903 when the Chicago South Park District funds the building of playgrounds using a $5 million bond. They build 10 new parks. Each park would have an enclosed gymnasium as well as outdoor space. And crucially, each park was going to be staffed by two physical education instructors. This inspired a national movement, and many of the playground instructors were, of course, disciples of G. Stanley Hall, and some of them had been trained at the YMCA schools around the country. They created age and sex-specific games to develop children from savages to cooperative team members. The freedom of the streets, however, seemed to be more attractive than structured play for many of the original targets of the playground movement, the children of immigrants who, according to those in power, needed to be Americanized. Professor Ryan Swanson, from whom we will hear later on this morning or this afternoon, brings us round to the strenuous life by characterizing TR's commitment to the strenuous life as an athletic crusade. That's a direct quote, an athletic crusade. For TR, physical, competitive sports provided a path to creating healthy individuals living in a healthy society. This fits perfectly with the social Darwinism prevalent at the time, but as Professor Swanson points out, the phrase, the strenuous life, was ambiguous enough, sufficiently transferable, and delightfully memorable to serve multiple purposes. And one of the ironies of the strenuous life is how it encouraged its very antithesis, spectatorship. So let me turn to the creation of new sports and to talk about sports as a national spectacle. So what's the connection between those muscular Christians encouraging exercise and the development of professional sports? The answer lies in how sports supposedly embodied the virtues muscular Christians sought to teach. Those virtues included the amateur ideal, fair play, cooperation for the sake of the greater good. 
For TR, outdoor sports provided the greatest exercise of fine moral qualities such as resolution, courage, endurance, and capacity to hold one's own and stand up under punishment. And to understand the origins of these sports, let me begin with that quintessentially English game, cricket. Every summer, village greens and urban parks across the country of England reverberate to the thwack of the willow bat hitting a leather ball. That's the sound of cricket. The sound of cricket and the sport of cricket probably developed in the 16th century and came across the Atlantic Ocean quite early on. The first newspaper reports of a cricket match appeared in 1751 in the American colonies, and three years later, Benjamin Franklin brought a copy of the rules of cricket across the Atlantic Ocean with him when he was returning to, to uh, Pennsylvania. The game caught on. An 1844 match between the US and Canada was the first modern international sporting event. It became popular across the country, including in the new town of Pullman outside Chicago. The center of American cricket was Philadelphia, and they had some enormously influential and very aristocratic cricket clubs in Philadelphia with very fine facilities, but also a very rich social life. They had regular um, teas, music days, dances, and youth programs teaching cooperation, amateurism, and fair play. Cricket caught on because wealthy Gilded Age Americans sought to emulate British aristocrats. Cricket is a form of conspicuous consumption. In cricket, you play in white from your shoes to your caps, all in white. If you're playing in white clothes on a green field, you know that something's going to happen when you dive to catch the ball or when you fall over trying to hit it. But they didn't care. The aristocrats didn't care because they weren't concerned about the cost of their clothing. Cricket also conspicuously consumed time. Matches could last anywhere from one day to five days with lunch and a tea break thrown in. In 1909, the British, I'm sorry, the Imperial Cricket Conference was founded to govern the game, and it ruled that no country outside of the British Empire could join this new confederation. This obviously excluded the United States, but that was okay because Americans were developing a new game, the game of baseball. Now, baseball probably evolved from a girls' game that's still played in England today called rounders. Rounders mutated into baseball or something close to it in the 1840s in New England and made its way to New York City. The original baseball teams were, were drinking clubs. They were skilled working men and lower middle class clerks who wanted to go out and play. They would cross the river over to New Jersey and play the sport of baseball. Their matches ended in a feast for both sides and the winning team would take home the match ball. A year before the Civil War broke out, however, this publication, Beadle's Dime Baseball Player, was published in New York City and sold about 50,000 copies. These copies were sold in both the North and the South, and they wound up in the hands of both Confederate and Union soldiers. This sport explained how to play baseball, essentially baseball, as a sport faster than cricket, Baseball, which just needed very simple equipment, a stick rather than a bat. A bat requires elaborate joinery. A stick can be almost anything you pick up in a, in a forest. You just need a stick, a ball, and four shirts thrown on the ground, and you have a baseball pitch. After the war, after the Civil War, baseball players worked hard to show that their game was respectable. They wrote about how baseball encouraged a love of order, discipline, and fair play making it an ideal sport in the imagined universe of G. Stanley Hall. Entrepreneurs seized on the potential, the commercial potential of baseball. The first enclosed grounds in New York City attracted ticket buying spectators. The players became professionals. They had lots of spare time. They practiced, of course, but they also engaged in a lot of gambling and drinking. With gate receipts, the owners were able to themselves contribute to the growth of the sport. Here is the flip side of the strenuous life. As one uncomplimentary editorial called uh, baseball players, they were dissipated gladiators. Dissipated gladiators. Now that's really 
putting those drunken gambling baseball players in their place. Commercial sport encouraged spectators to sit and drink and gamble on the game, the very antithesis of the strenuous life. Fair play, admitting that you made a mistake or that there was a rule violation and that you didn't need a referee or an umpire to correct it, went out of the window. Winning at all costs became central to the sport of baseball. Cheating to win became acceptable. Gambling became commonplace. But to give baseball its due, baseball did give Americans a sense of place. It did offer Americans a, a, a local identity. People of all ethnic stripes would identify with local baseball teams. And in an age of rapid change, of mass migration, of urbanization, baseball teams came to represent groups of people. The allegiance to the team bound people together. And for the men who played the game, professionally or not, it was an opportunity to demonstrate their masculine qualities and to show off their skills. The tremendous popularity of baseball meant that Americans began talking of it as the national pastime. By 1903, two professional major leagues, the American League and the National League, were operating. And by 1908, baseball had its anthem, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Commercial baseball had arrived, and for Theodore Roosevelt, this was a deplorable development. He wrote, commercialism, though sometimes inevitable, is always an unhealthy element in any sport. And when it becomes the chief factor in continuing the sport's existence, it is time for that sport to be brought to an end. Well, of course, baseball wasn't brought to an end. Baseball thrived. But if baseball is the epitome of middle-class American and working-class American sport, golf was emblematic of the upper class in the Gilded Age. Golf, along with swimming and tennis, the so-called country club sports, became a craze for wealthy Americans in the Gilded Age. Transplanted from Scotland, the first course was of course called St. Andrews after the famous Scottish Lynx. The first professionally designed course funded by William K. Vanderbilt was built on Long Island. Golf found a ready audience in the urban centers of the United States and even spread to the South when wealthy Americans went to places like Florida for winter. Golf was a way for rich men to imitate the British aristocracy they so admired. And of course it attracted an elite audience, but unlike cricket, women played golf. In 1894, the first women's tournament was held in New Jersey, and it was a woman, Eastette Miller, who invented handicapping. The golf carried elitist connotations, and indeed, it was so much an elite sport that, of course, as you know, Taft was warned by Theodore Roosevelt to avoid playing golf, and certainly to avoid being seen playing golf, because for a public figure, golf is fatal to one's reputation. Nevertheless, middle-class Americans followed elites into the golf courses and the game grew in popularity as the number of country clubs expanded and their entry fees and the dues fell within the incomes, the discretionary income of middle-class Americans. But golf and baseball would pale in comparison compared to the sport of football. As the crusade for physical fitness represented by muscular Christianity and the strenuous life showed, Wealthy Americans were, by the 1880s, moving away from the idea that a life of luxury and ease was a life well lived. Instead, competitive sports became associated with character building, with teaching desirable traits such as respectability, integrity, and sportsmanship, and were seen to carry the strenuous life into college life. In football, it is the elite institutions who took the lead. If you think about basketball, basketball was born in the YMCA. Think about golf. Golf emerged on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Think about baseball. Baseball emerged in drinking clubs in the New York's metropolitan area. But football was a product of American higher education. It developed in elite institutions like Harvard and came to embody muscular Christianity. Football led the way for sports to become an integral part of higher education in a way that it simply is not in Europe or indeed in most of the rest of the world. 
Football originated as an unacceptable game. It originated in 1827 as a dangerous Harvard initiation rite, an initiation rite that often resulted in broken legs and noses and torn ears and all the rest of it. Yale students, loving a bit of fun, copied that Harvard initiation rite. And those two universities would become the dominant universities in American football. Football, as it grew into a sport, resembled rugby. The sport of rugby was invented in the school of the same name back in England, supposedly when a player playing rugby by the name of William Webb Ellis got sick of the idea that you could only pass the ball backwards. He picked it up and ran with it forwards and created a new sport. They were playing soccer. He picked up the ball. He ran with it. Rugby was supposedly invented. That's like the origin myth of baseball, a myth, but it's a lovely story. What it offers, though, is the idea that private schools soon began, private schools in England soon began to play rugby as well. They emulated that game of rugby. In 1876, Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and Princeton formed the Intercollegiate Football Association, and their football did indeed look like rugby with an emphasis on the kicking game. And one of the players in these early games at Yale University was a man by the name of Walter Camp. Walter Camp is justifiably remembered as the father of American football. As the coach at Yale University, he introduced rule changes that would forever alter American football. Camp did not like the unpredictable elements of rugby, so he developed the line of scrimmage. The line of scrimmage is the football equivalent of the scrum. In the scrum, you have players from both sides essentially locking horns and trying to push the football, which is put into the middle of the scrum, out to their end. In the line of scrimmage, one team automatically starts with the football. There's no chance about who's going to get the football. So Walter Camp decreed that you could have the football and you could keep the football as long as you could make five yards in three downs. Now, it's important to point out here there was no forward pass because there was no forward pass in rugby. Most important of all for the future of the game, camp replaced the power of the captains with the power of the coach. Because he was working full-time in a watch factory in New Haven, Connecticut, he sent his wife Alice to observe practices and take notes, and then he would call the captains over to his house, they would talk about the practices, they would read through the notes, and he would deliver his idea for the strategies for the practices and for the games. And his system worked. Between 1872 and 1909, when Walter Camp was the coach at Yale, Yale's football team won 324 games, they lost 17, and they tied 18. I wonder if Yale has won 324 games since Walter Camp retired. I don't know. Probably they have. Camp sent former players around the country. He sent them to spread the gospel of football and to coach college teams. He wrote coaching manuals. He invented the All-American team and chose it himself. He helped to publicize the game and he helped to create the sport as we know it today. Harvard and Yale, of course, no longer dominate the game of football, but we should not be surprised it developed at elite Ivy League colleges because the game, as Walter Camp and other prophets of football saw it, exemplified the values of muscular Christianity. As you know, TR attended Harvard, but he did not, of course, play football there. His son, Ted, eldest son, Ted, did, however. Most famously, Ted had his nose broken by opposing players and was often on the end of rough treatment because, well, you know, they're playing against the president's son, so why not beat him up a bit? This is a photograph taken at the end of his final game playing football. He was only a freshman. He only played for less than a full season. His, in his final game, he broke his ankle, and that was it. He was done. That injury ended the 130-pound Ted's football career. And while TR praised Ted for his fortitude and set about reforming football, football caught the mood of the elite precisely. Football taught obedience to authority, specialization at work, and cooperation with others. And for Theodore Roosevelt, it taught the virtues of a strenuous life. 
Of course, TR would find the college football of today unacceptable, and we know that because he gave a speech at Harvard in 1905 when he complained about college sports becoming too professional back then in 1905. He said, it is a bad thing for any college man to grow to regard sport as the serious business of life. It is a bad thing to permit sensationalism and hysteria to shape the development of our sports. And finally, it is a much worse thing to permit college sport to become in any way or shape tainted by professionalism or by so much as the slightest suspicion of professionalism. Well, in an age when the two highest paid public servants in many states around the country are the flagship university's head football coach and the flagship university's head basketball coach, you can imagine what TR would say about that development. So let me draw things to a close here and give you a chance to ponder possible questions. It's fair to say that though TR did not play football, he actually loved the sport. For him, football exhibited all the benefits of the strenuous life of self-sacrifice, of regular physical exercise, and of bravely confronting challenges. But this violent, brutal, and sometimes deadly sport had to be regulated. And as Professor Swanson will explain later today, TR took the lead in trying to make football a safer sport. Theodore Roosevelt himself, of course, was unafraid of physical activity. Um, anyone who dared to accept an invitation or a summons to meet him at the White House understood the risks involved that might involve a tennis match. It might involve a point-to-point -point walk through Rock Creek Park. There would undoubtedly be some kind of exercise involved if TR considered you uh, virtuous enough to engage with him. As Mike Cullinane reminded us last night, meetings in the president's office could easily become physical activities and members of the tennis cabinet were, were chosen that way. Like many people, TR felt Americans, despite his love of tennis, were becoming lazy. He wanted to set an example and he was unafraid to allow journalists to report on his horse riding, on his strenuous walks and to report on, if not photograph, his tennis matches. Commerce and materialism had, critics at the time proclaimed, created a nation of weaklings and the nation needed physical exercise. It had lost sight of physical fitness. <coughs> Workers sitting at their desks had become a nation of loafers, and instead of meeting the physical challenges and benefiting from the hard outdoor labor pre-industrial society offered the vast majority of people, America's industrial economy was fueled by paper as much as it was by coal. For TR and others concerned about the loss of physical labor, about the emphasis on materialism, and on the way men, and they were primarily worried about men, were pushed into meaningless lives of luxury and comfort, this tendency had to be arrested. As TR's friend and Navy expert Alfred T. Mayen wrote, contemporary society had become obsessed with, quote, worship of comfort, wealth, and general softness. And indeed, some argued, without a war to fight and without a frontier to conquer, Americans had indeed succumbed to Mayan's general softness. Hence, for TR and other advocates of the strenuous life, football was the perfect sport. It was a miniature, carefully controlled form of warfare inculcating martial values. The command structure, leading from coach on the sidelines to quarterback and captains on the field, all the way down to the lowliest of linemen, and I say that in quotation marks because I have heard that linemen are among the most intelligent players on the field, down to the lowliest of linemen, football taught obedience to those in authority. Teamwork was essential, the kind of teamwork that be carried, could be carried into a business hierarchy, into any kind of collective activity. Football was, if you like, the most obvious example of G. Stanley Hall's explanation for how humans develop through play. The cooperation vital to the efficient functioning of a football team could be translated into a myriad of settings across the country. It should be obvious by now that the strenuous life left its mark on the sporting landscape. From pastimes to commercial spectacles, sports became professionalized big businesses and adherents of the strenuous life for all watched helplessly as the number of desk jobs grew and as the number and reach of commercial sports also expanded. TR advanced the strenuous life but grew concerned about the power 
of commercial sport. In the fifth year of his presidency, he gave a speech at Harvard University in which he said, I think our effort should be to minimize rather than to increase that kind of love of athletics which manifests itself not in joining in the athletic sports, but in crowding by tens of thousands to see other people indulge in them. And toward the end of his life, as war threatened in Europe, he worried about the physical state of American manhood. For him, for TR, preparedness meant being physically and mentally ready for war. He wrote in 1915 that the indispensable thing for every free people to do in the present day is with efficiency to prepare against war by making itself able physically to defend its rights. And yet he and so many others feared that America was not prepared. The spiritual and physical values of muscular Christianity needed to be promotion and TR to the end of his days promoted them publicly and privately. Thank you. Simon, that was splendid. That was a tremendous uh, foundation for our conversation. I know the audience has questions and we have ample time. We have about uh, 20 minutes or 25 minutes here. So let me start by asking this question. Um, you know, you talked about class, golf and tennis at sort of the top echelon, America trying to imitate the Brits and then baseball is more working class and middle class and so on. Can you talk a little bit about race and the development of American sport? Because there was heavy segregation, of course, and we all know uh, the recent history of this, but talk a little bit about what was going on with recent immigrants and with African Americans or Native Americans all, as these dynamics began to play out. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Clay. Yeah, that's a big question, um, and luckily I have 20 minutes to answer it, so I'll give it a go. Of course, for African Americans, this was a segregated society and sports were equally segregated, although baseball was something of an exception. There were African American athletes playing baseball at a professional level until, uh, and I can't remember the year, I think it was 1905, 1906, when a Chicago Cubs captain refused to take the field against an opposing team because that team had an African American player. And from that moment on, and the Cubs at the time were in the National League, of course, from that moment on, the, the color bar was erected. And so for African Americans, there were limited opportunities to play organized sports, certainly limited opportunities to play organized sports on fields that we would consider to be adequate. The gymnasiums and the playgrounds of the um, Chicago South Park District were also segregated. The, uh, the whole thrust of muscular Christianity was a racist thrust. It was a social Darwinistic thrust. It was an ideology that said, yes, we have to make sure that white Americans and in the UK, white Brits were physically able to demonstrate both the fitness to rule and then also to survive and climb to the top of the social ladder. As for uh, Native Americans, the sport of lacrosse, of course, is becoming incredibly important today. And lacrosse was a sport that was documented by French missionaries as early as the early 17th century. And so um, uh, Native Americans have certainly contributed to the sporting landscape in a way that perhaps has become increasingly recognized. Another possible crossover sport is boxing. Um, boxing was incredibly popular in the United States in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. And some of the most important fights and fighters, you mentioned Louis Sullivan yesterday, some of the fights and fighters were uh, both national events and the fighters themselves were national and sometimes international celebrities. And so boxing provides an example of a sport where if a white fighter was willing to enter the arena with an African-American fighter, then there was the possibility for that kind of contest. But it was very rare, especially in the Gilded Age. And could be controversial. So 
at the end, you talked about TR's admiration for football, but he didn't play it himself. And when you tried it, I was thinking while you were talking, well, what did he do? And his, he was not so much a team sport person as an individual or bipolar sportist. So judo, boxing, wrestling, uh, hiking, but these are more individualistic. You know, did he have theories of individual versus team? I can well imagine that, I don't know. The answer is I don't know. But I can imagine that, being an academic, I'm going to take a stab at it anyway. I can imagine that TR would have read and understood the theories of G. Stanley Hall, and so he would have appreciated the, um, the virtues of team sports as a, a, not necessarily a higher form of sport, but certainly as a sport that, to, that taught values that were important to the strenuous life and important to this industrializing nation. But even say in point to point, that's not a team activity, it's can you keep up with me? And under certain circumstances, if you're, if you're struggling up the cliff in Rock Creek Park, we might help you up. But it wasn't, let's go out together and find a way up that hill, it's can you keep up with me? So that heavily individualistic nature of Roosevelt is really striking to me compared to the team sports that were beginning to develop all around him. Yeah. And he's in that, um, that famous puck image trying to get Taft through the hoop, but there's no evidence that he ever played basketball, is there? Not that I know of, no. Yeah. no. So, and that really made me also think during your talk about muscular Christianity, what, when was the high point of it and why did it, how did it fade and become less important in the 20th century? It was a victim of its own success and it was a victim of a secularizing society. Um, Muscular Christianity was always the ideology of a small proportion of the population as an overt ideology. It did influence sports, obviously, and it influenced the playground movement. And it had a tremendous impact on the way in which wealthy and influential Americans looked at life and looked at their society. Muscular Christianity was a slogan more than a movement. And the, the originators of muscular Christianity, Charles Kingsley and Thomas Hughes, initially rejected the term. They didn't think that what they were writing about, they were novelists, they weren't necessarily writing about some kind of great um, campaign or crusade. Certainly, the ideals of muscular Christianity influenced the YMCA, the YMCA as we know it today, to some extent still combines the, the ideals of a an active spiritual life with a competitive athletic landscape. Now, I suppose that most of us think of the Y as a place where you have a swimming pool and a field house and some uh, sport grounds, sports fields outside. Um, but it's still the Young Christian Men's Association, although, of course, they have uh, now admit women as well. And the YMCA... I suppose is the longest lasting legacy of muscular Christianity. So I was struck by several of the quotations that you put up, um, which make it seem as if, if TR could observe us, he'd be appalled. Um, 65,000 people in a stadium watching other professionals, some of them paid 12, 15, 30 million dollars per annum, play on their behalf and then fantasy leagues, which don't require any sweating. Uh, gambling, which is increasingly prominent now in all commercial sport. Um, his anxiety about the professionalization of college athletes, imagine what he would say today. Uh, talk about that. So is he just out of date or was he right and we've really failed to understand the meaning of sport? Yeah, that's a tough question because there is an intense physical fitness movement in the United States today. You can't go to any small town in the United States without seeing at least one uh, physical fitness exercise um, franchise. And so TR was, I think, both of his time, but also strangely ahead of his time. I mean, if you look at college football today, especially at Division I college football, and, and I enjoy watching the game, as I'm sure most of us here do. Nonetheless, what we're watching are amateur athletes who are being 
paid with a college degree, a college degree, or at least with a college experience, which is incredibly constrained by the fact of their being members of these sports. They can't take classes at certain times because they have practices. They can't take times at classes at certain times because they have film. They can't do all sorts of things that other students can do to get to wring the full life out of college. And at the same time as these young athletes are taking the field, they're generating millions and millions of dollars in wealth. Well, in the United States, we like to say that those who generate the wealth should benefit from the wealth. Well, the only benefit that college athletes are getting is the scholarship that enables them to be students. And that scholarship is in many cases contingent upon their continuing to play the sport. They're generally one year renewable scholarships and that's a product of the 1970s before 1973 i think it was athletes were guaranteed four years of support whether they got injured and couldn't play or not anymore that's simply no longer the case and so as they're generating all this wealth as they're appearing on television and of course part of the attraction i get it for a 19 or 20 year old young man, part of the attraction is that you're going to be on ABC television on Saturday afternoon. You're going to be on ESPN virtually every time you play. I get that, I understand it. But nonetheless, TR would look at that and say, we have lost the idea of what education is about. When we are strangling the humanities, when, when we are avoiding the fact that higher education should be a place of critical education when we are applauding for all the right reasons Dickinson State University for making an incredible contribution to and commitment to the humanities and to history specifically TR would say yes that's fantastic thank you DSU what about the rest of you what are you doing and the answer is, well, we're busy watching football and we're busy generating grants and we're busy worrying about things that are perhaps secondary to teaching young people how to think, how to see the world and how to mature. Not what to think, not what to see, but how to equip you with the tools you need to succeed. That would be, in an ideal world, the sole college outcome. Oh, wonderfully said. Thank you for that. So, Simon, apropos of that, it always strikes me as so ironic when you're watching some sporting event on television, a collegiate sport, and the announcer says, this coach is really an extraordinary man because he cares whether his students get a degree. You think, that has to be extraordinary? But it is, of course, um, or it's often the case. So just one last question, and then the audience. Uh, so much of this originates in England. So we borrow from English sport, even baseball. Uh, rounders? Yeah. Right. Indigenous sport, basketball. Uh, what else have we done that isn't dependent in some way or other on British precedents? Jazz? No, I mean sport. <laughs> <laughs> sport, my friend. <laughs> Okay, um, all right, what other American sports are there? Uh, hmm. Volleyball. Okay, yeah, badminton. volleyball, another YMCA sport, that's true. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. And there are others, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry? Bowling. Bowling, yes. Ping pong. Well, we didn't do ping pong. <laughs> Is NASCAR a sport? Can you get in a car and drive fast? Well, now we're on dangerous ground. Now you're, you know, let me remind you, you are in the state of North Dakota, my friend. <laughs> Uh, so let's see what's on the audience's mind. Uh, yes, beginning here. It, I have the impression muscular Christianity is a, it's a, it's a very Protestant um, set of ideals. So my question is, how did the Catholic Church respond to it? And with the rise of parochial Catholic schools, is there anyone within that who's kind of like an indicate uh, community? Simon, we need to repeat the questions because of the people streaming. So, so uh, th he sees this as largely a Protestant movement. What about Catholics and, and the rise of parochial schools? How does this play a role in all of these developments? Uh, so for um, 
Yes, it is primarily a Protestant movement. And yes, Catholics initially rejected it as an ideology. In part, of course, because it's aimed at immigrants, especially Catholic immigrants. And so I hinted at it, but the primary, if you like, the primary targets of muscular Christianity in the United States avoided the muscular Christians. So where the playgrounds in Chicago found a ready audience among middle class kids, not so, not so much amongst immigrant kids. Part of that, of course, was because of the pressures of work. I mean, we don't outlaw child labor in this country until the New Deal. And so immigrant families are reliant largely upon the entire family working, including children. In terms of who within the Catholic hierarchy would have either overtly rejected or perhaps quietly supported muscular Christianity or the ideals of physical education, I do not know the answer to that question. It's a good question because, of course, today, parochial schools have excellent, generally have excellent um, athletic facilities. One of the attractions of going to a parochial school can be precisely that. Catholic leagues are known for producing fine athletes across the country. And so, yeah, I don't know. That's, a, that's an interesting one to ponder. And this is the first of many times I'll be saying I don't know today. Here's a question, yes. Uh, Dr. Carter, you, you mentioned uh, race and ethnicity in sports. And uh, when I think about James, or Jim Ford, winning the Olympics in 1912, being a, a national sensation. Did TR ever comment on that? Did TR ever comment on James Thorpe? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. See, there it is again. However, um, so of course, Thorpe would have represented an assimilated Native American. And so in that sense, he would have been seen as an success example story, of the yeah. success, yeah, of the success of, of, of Americanization. Uh, over in this, yes. yeah. Is there any story or anecdote that the Olympics? Does, Does Roosevelt have opinions, opinions on the Olympics? <laughs> the Olympic <laughs> movement was so close to the end of his time in, in, in office that no, I don't think he did. I mean, I don't. The Olympics were pretty disorganized in the United States. The, I mean, the, the, the first attempts by the United States to enter athletes into the Olympics were notable failures. Um, there was no system to choose athletes. There was no understanding of what those events might be over there in Europe. And so, unlike today, where the Olympics are an incredibly well-oiled machine and that every country has its Olympic committee that makes sure the facilities and the time are available to elite athletes, that simply wasn't the case in TR's lifetime. Yes, sir? Yeah, part of the answer, I think, to the uh, A and the uh, Newspaper boy taking boxing. Yeah. Yeah. Did you just have a question? No, no, no. Just a comment. So, a comment on commercialization and James Thorpe, and then uh, his advocacy of young people using boxing as a way up. Yes, let's go over here to Michael. Simon, thanks for That was wonderful. And I just wanted to ask you uh, Robert Lee said this period was about a search for order. And I was wondering if you could. Uh, compare the idea of that search for order, all the rule books that you put up, I think the British uh, come up with the, the rule book for soccer in this time period. How does that compare with the idea of play that G. Stanley Hall was talking about? What's the playoff between order and play? Order v. play. Yeah, play and order go together exceptionally well in G. Stanley Hall's universe because, of course, he wants it to be structured. And so if you allow play to be completely free of any kind of rules or even any kind of direction, then you're going to lose mature adults, according to G. Stanley Hall. So 
the age of order is a perfect metaphor for what's happening in sports. I mean, that's one of the reasons, of course, that Walter Camp moved away from the scrum to the line of scrimmage, was because it's more orderly, because you can predict what's going to happen, and that predictability is important. And the rule changes that American football experiences in the early ages are to make it both more of an entertaining spectacle, but also to make it somewhat more controlled, so that the coach can keep command of what's happening on the field by sending in the plays, by training the players to perform certain plays. It's a, it's a very structured, orderly sport. Uh, Ryan? Uh, did TR or others kind of draw the line between a country's uh, participation in sports and their military prowesses, kind of like war game preparation for folks that would be in the infantry or the cavalry. And that's a great, a great question. question. You know, the, where does this begin to sort of lead into preparedness in Plattsburgh and so on? Yeah, very much so. I mean, Plattsburgh is a great example because um, Archie went to, to Plattsburgh. Archie was, of course, um, uh, TR's second son. And TR looked down on Archie a little bit because he saw him as a physical weakling and forced him to take extra exams at Groton to get into Harvard. And... Um, Nonetheless, Archie matured and excelled at Plattsburgh. And so that, that fear of the lack of preparedness, that fear of the lack of readiness for war is one of the motivating factors for funding a sporting infrastructure. Now, of course, preparedness for war in an ideal world is preparedness for avoiding war. So you could argue that what TR is asking for is not so much a belligerent country as a, for a strong country that no other country would dare invade. And that was part of the concern. Lazy Americans, as, as they were seen, were a danger to the country because someone else, maybe Germany, maybe Britain, maybe France, would invade American territory secure in the knowledge that Americans couldn't fight back because they've been spending all their time um, watching football and reading books. But you... You will acknowledge that, in addition to TR's belief that the best defense for the country is to be well prepared, there was a certain thirst for war in Roosevelt. He thought of war as cleansing, that uh, we need a war from time to time. We need to tune ourselves up. We need to challenge ourselves in the world's arena. It wasn't as if he thought, in the ideal world, there will be no war. Um, he just wanted wars that were manageable for success. And yes, and that's part of the social Darwinism of the age, where, where wars are indeed seen as necessary in order to demonstrate one's fitness for survival, in order to make sure that countries that aren't fit don't survive. And so, yes, I would say that is an excellent counterbalance to my somewhat more pacific <laughs> tale. Go ahead. Given the obvious racism during the Gilded Age, what would TR think today of yeah, calls for speculation, but today the, the great majority of, of athletes in, in collegiate sports are African American. Uh, would he have thoughts about that? I think T.R. would have no trouble with it, in part because he was open to African Americans. Um, I know he has some stains on his record there as well, but. You could argue that by the standards of the time, he was perhaps a little bit more progressive than most Americans. And you could also argue, I think, that he would understand that sports ultimately are an expression of merit. And so if you are good enough to become the starting quarterback or to become the center for a college team, then there's nothing wrong with that. We have a few more minutes here. Who has not asked a question? So yes, go ahead. Compliment. Thank you very much for the stimulating conversation or your talk. But uh, uh, jumping around here, uh, year 2022, I, I will support, cheer for any land grant college before I will cheer for a church supported university. Uh, you know, I, uh, you just think of all the great church supported colleges, Notre Dame, Creighton. Gonzaga, Baylor, whatever, but I still love the land grant colleges, North Dakota State, Montana State, and that. Uh, 
and then but then you drop it down to the NAIA level and you get to the playoffs and I believe it is the church schools that dominate that in the playoffs in football. So I'm not sure what to make of that, except that. Um, yeah, I know. I'm off the wall. So that the, the interplay and tension maybe between um, Notre Dame and Loyola and schools like that, and then the land grant institutions that he prefers. So, of course, Notre Dame is an interesting example because we know Notre Dame in large measure because of its football team. It's quite a small school in an obscure corner of the greater Chicago area. And nonetheless, it has become a football powerhouse. Um, Notre Dame, thanks in large measure to a coach by the name of Newt Rockney, was able to garner a tremendous amount of support from the Chicago area. And we talk about the subway fans or the, um, the fans who travel down to South Bend on the electric trains to watch Notre Dame games. For those universities, sports, as for every university, is a way to recruit students. And you could certainly understand that investing in sporting facilities, investing in the recruiting, would be central to universities that don't necessarily have um, a natural constituency outside of their particular faith, tradition, or their particular um, concerns. And s athletics becomes a way of gaining a tremendous amount of prominence and advertising. And it's a commercial bargain that I think that we are still reckoning with, both in the land-grant institutions, Iowa State, the school where I teach, is a land-grant, it's Iowa's land-grant institution. In fact, it was the first land-grant institution in the United States, the first chartered land-grant institution. And it is a place where we still deal with that tension between being a place where we want to train virtually anyone who wants to get and is, is, is qualified to earn a college degree, but also to become an elite sporting institution. And those two goals are perhaps not always um, compatible. And you can see the same tension in um, Catholic schools as well in, in university, at the University of Notre Dame. And Baptist and so on. Let's do uh, two more questions, yes. Yeah, well, Ryan may speak to this, but where does TR fit in the establishment of the NCAA? Yeah, he was one of the loudest voices calling for the regulation of, in this case, American football. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I will let Ryan talk about that this afternoon, but yes, he's there, definitely. One more. Yeah, yeah, I just have a quick question. So, 20-ish percent of the population in the target group uh, qualifies for military service right now, and about 
Yeah, compared to much of the rest of the world, the American diet, and the American diet is spreading to the rest of the world, unfortunately, isn't the healthiest. And so my suspicion is part of that lack of energy, part of that um, failure to meet the physical standards of the armed forces is at least in part down to what people eat and drink. And how sedentary we are. One last question, and then I know the president has a gift for you. So for TR, there's a double anxiety, and anxiety is a, the term I want you to talk about. Um, he has personal anxiety that he was a uh, weakling, that he had to make his body, that he had to prove something, and he spent a lifetime doing that, often recklessly. But he also had social anxiety when he looked around and saw the urbanization of the country. Can you just talk about the, the you know, it's, it's not all positive. There's an anxiety element in Roosevelt. Oh, absolutely. Um, TR was worried for the future. He was incredibly concerned that the country that he saw developing around him was a country that was destroying people as much as it was perhaps enabling them to grow and to live and to survive. And so the materialist values that increasingly came to dominate American life were values that TR worried were getting in the way of if not necessarily a spiritual life, at least an intellectual engagement with the world around you. TR was a great reader, a, 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 a prolific author. He was always engaged with his contemporary world and much of that engagement was at the level of concern, at the level of we are destroying the very people that we need in order to thrive and grow as a society. Thank you so much. The president has a gift for you. I hope it's barbells. End of violence. Simon Cordery.